to the College Game Day Podcast, post One Shining Moment edition. It was not a shining night in Glendale, Arizona for the Purdue Boilermakers, who played with some metal in the first half. Don't roll your eyes at me, Porcello. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. No, it was good. That was good. Um, <laughs> we're a little punchy here, uh, approaching midnight in, uh, in Glendale. UConn 75, Purdue 60. Back-to-back titles for UConn, the program's sixth national title since 1999. Jeff Borzello, you gave away Purdue's the game plan that Purdue clearly didn't listen to our podcast, because if they did, they would have known exactly what UConn was going to do. Uh, walk me through the genius of what UConn did defensively and how that let them win this game. They essentially did not give any help to Donovan Klingon on Zach Eady. They said, he's gonna, we're going to let him score his points. I think they did thought Klingon might do a better job early on against him. I mean, he had 14 uh, in the first 12 minutes. But they said, we're going to guard him one-on-one. We're not going to help off of any of their shooters. And Purdue went into the game as the number two most accurate three-point shooting team in the country. And they ended the game shooting one for seven. The only made they ha- make made three they had was Braden Smith's uh, kind of desperation shot as the, as the shot clock was winding down in the first half. And so they essentially dared Purdue to beat them with twos and free throws, which in 2024 is really hard to do, especially when, you know, UConn has just has the number of weapons they do. Um, and so, you know, Klingon got into foul trouble. Samson Johnson got into foul trouble. And it still didn't really matter. I mean, Edie had 37, which is the most points ever scored by a losing player in the title game. Uh, and again, and they still won by 15 and weren't really tested uh, for the final 20-ish minutes of the game. So it, it worked. And, and, and after the game, uh, speaking to... UConn assistant Luke Murray, and he said, you look at the numbers going into the game, their offensive, effic- offensive efficiency did not change throughout the season, whether Edie uh, played well, great, good. It was what the other guys did. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned on the other podcast the other night, his his scoring number, his scoring averages in their four losses and their 34 or whatever wins was exactly the same, 25 points per game. He's going to get his either way, and the other guys had to make shots, and, and they just didn't. And, and UConn really focused on that, and it worked out. It reminded me a little bit, since this is a primarily college football podcast, I'm going to make a football reference to uh, Bill Belichick as the defensive coordinator for the Giants in the Super Bowl against the Bills. Uh, he told his players, if uh, I think it was Thurman Thomas rushes for over 125 yards, we'll win. Because it meant that they weren't letting Jim Kelly and Andre Reid and those guys chuck the ball around the yard. Uh, the Patriots, I believe, had a similar game plan against the greatest show on turf. Uh in the uh, first Super Bowl of the uh, of the Belichick dynasty, I got I got Syracuse in the last podcast, the Patriots in this one, so I'm doing pretty doing pretty good checking all my all my boxes, Jeff Porzello. But I, I felt like it was the same thing. Uh, you know, it, it was at the end. I thought it was pretty fitting. There was a couple times that Edie got some easy baskets at the end, and it, the game was already decided. And I was sort of you know he, he like grabbed a rebound and threw a, a dunk back in, and, and he had easy baskets on like back back possessions. And I was like, that's pretty much what they wanted him to do tonight. Yeah. Um, have you do you recall in a stage like this as good of a perimeter defensive performance as UConn put on? Not really, um, especially you know in a, in a game like this that where the other guys had been playing pretty well, uh, at least scoring the ball. I mean, Brandon Smith had trouble against NC State, but he actually played pretty well in the first half for Purdue. They just could not get any clean looks. Like Lance Jones didn't get any clean looks. Fletcher Lawyer did not. I don't think he scored a point uh, at all in the game, and mm-hmm. it, it just. I mean, it's it, it's funny because, you know, and I like I mentioned I talked to Luke Murray. He said that that he got some looks in the first half when Edie was scoring at will and Purdue was winning, yeah, because it did look like. Now I'm not sure if UConn felt in danger for the first time all tournament or anything like that, but it did feel like Purdue was kind of doing what they wanted to on offense, and mm-hmm. and really didn't have an answer for Edie. I mean, we never we hadn't seen Klingon get dominated like that at all, uh, and and Edie did whatever he wanted and. You know, in retrospect, that just sort of played into UConn's hands because Purdue kept trying to do it. And I I think UConn eventually thought, hey, they can't really score more than 60 ish if it's just Edie and we're going to score more than that. Uh, But no, I I, I, it was a real dominant defensive performance. I mean, again, one made three pointer. Uh, I think the stat was that's the fewest makes since Butler in 2011. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Which was a memorable title game. Um, (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, so no, they 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 followed the scouting report, the game plan to a T, uh, and and ultimately came out with yet another very comfortable, no sweat win. 
I thought the the stretch that really determined the game was the first five minutes of the second half. That's where UConn took control of it. I remember looking uh, up right at the 15 minute mark, and at that point, the Purdue is down, I think nine or eleven, and they'd only attempted two three pointers in the first 25 minutes. And I was just like, well, there's no way they're going to come back. Like it's just like statistically, you're not you, you can't overcome that kind of deficit. It's like a it's like a team that runs, with, you know, that plays in the fullback in, in college football and they get down, you know, it's like Iowa or Wisconsin getting down 14. Like, how the heck are they ever going to come back? Like, it just seemed like the the way that they were playing, there was not an avenue back for them. And, and and UConn just eventually squeezed the life out of them to, to close the half. And we, we keep talking about how Purdue's non ED players didn't do anything. There was, I don't know if you remember it, it was at the right around the eight minute mark of the first half. ED scored again and he looked at Hurley, he looked at the UConn bench. And kind of, you know, was talking a little trash. And then him and Hurley exchanged words at that media timeout. And from that point until I think it was 13 something minutes left in the second half, which was, you know, a a 14 minute ish stretch. Edie had one field goal during that stretch. And, you know, we've spent the first however many minutes of this podcast talking about how his teammates didn't do anything. If he's only scoring two points in a in a 14 minute stretch against the best team we've seen in however many years, it's obviously not a good sign. No, it's not. We have not reflected on too many individual UConn players at this point, Jeff. So I think when you look back on this title game five years from now, is it Tristan Newton's overall dominance? Is it uh, Cam Spencer? You know, he scored 11, It's it, and he only had uh, two assists, but it seemed like he was, uh, you know, his typical pest and maybe a little more productive than the stat line was. Uh, Caravan didn't have a good game, but he hit big shots at, at big times. Uh, Cass, was, like, how, how are you going to remember the individual UConn performances a few years from now? I don't know if I'm going to remember a single individual performance, to be honest. I mean, and, and that's that's kind of what makes this dominance so interesting. Um, you know, Newton was the best player on the floor for UConn for the second title game in a row. And he, he did the same thing last year against San Diego State. Um, and and he won most outstanding player this year. And Klingon was great for, you know, most of the tournament until tonight. Uh, Steph, you know, Castle was just tremendous, pretty much all tournament, especially in the final four. But I don't know if 10 years ago, 10 years from now, I'm going to say, oh, remember that Tristan Newton performance. I think it's going to be remember those those five guys. I mean, you mentioned Caravan. I, I don't know if and, and I tweeted this during game. It seems like every three pointer he's ever made is just backbreaking. Like it's whether it's in transition or off an offensive rebound. It just seems like they're daggers, all of them. And, you know, Ray Allen said something about uh, at the end of the, after the game, he said that that's what kind of really stood out to him about this year's team is that, you know, he watches a bunch of games on TV throughout the year. And he's like, in one game, it's Newton, one game, it's Castle, one game, it's Klingon. And it's just those five guys, those five starters, they complement each other really, really well. And, you know, there's just, I don't, you know, Newton was an all American, but, you know, coaches on the team will say Spencer was the most important player. Guys in the big East will say Klingon was their most important player. And so it's just, it's really just a balanced effort. That that has really stood out for them for kind of two years now. So you, you wrote the game story for ESPN.com tonight. Uh, I did a column that sort of stepped back and, and said, "Where does this UConn team rank?" Uh, and there, I think there's some pretty pretty jaw dropping uh, historical markers, Jeff, that, that that this team has come across. Obviously, we've talked about this a bunch on the pod the the, the last few weeks since you become uh, since you become a regular here. Uh, with your good hair replacing Reese's good hair a bunch of times. Uh, you know, this is the uh, first back-to-back since Billy Donovan's Florida teams in 06-07. The prior repeat champions before that were Mike Krzyzewski's Duke teams, 91-92. Obviously, Bobby Hurley was the start of those teams. And then the uh, we go John Wooden's UCLA teams, who did it like nine times because they won a billion titles in a row. But those from the 60s, uh, they, they won, they won a, a, a slew through 73. Ed Jucker, Cincinnati teams in 61, 62 with Oscar Robinson. Phil Wolpert, San Francisco, 55 and 56. And then Adolph Ruff of Kentucky and Henry Ibe of Oklahoma State. That is the category. And, and those are the peers now of Danny Hurley as a coach of repeat champions. Um, and I, I guess it's stepping back, I, I wrote like, you know, where, where does this UConn team rank? And my summation was like, they, they probably – don't have as much talent as some of these other teams if we're if we're gauging repeat champions. I was I was blown away. Ninety two Duke had eight players drafted. Uh, now some of them were in the second round. So you go, 
Leitner, you got Grant Hill, you got Bobby Hurley, uh, you know, Cherokee Parks was a young player on that. Like they're, you know, these are just the talent collection is different. Eras are different. Everything's different. Um, wh- where do you think that this UConn team, uh, you know, ends up resonating? And, and do they have an, an argument to be one of the great all time teams? Or this maybe, as Hurley contextualized it, one of the great all time runs in college basketball history? I think I side more with the runs. Um, just the, the, the stats from this year's tournament. I mean, the stats from last year's tournament were eye-opening in themselves. I mean, they they beat teams by an average of 20 a game in last year's tournament. This year was even more dominant. It was 23.3 this year. And, you know, they led by double figures for something like, I think it was like 90-something minutes out of 120 by double digits in the second half. They trailed for less than 10 minutes total, I want to say, uh, in the entire NCAA tournament. And this was a just a purely dominant performance. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I can count. I mean, I can count on maybe two fingers how many times I really thought this tournament that UConn was in trouble. Uh, it just there was no real, there was no point that, that where it was like okay they actually might lose. You know, the Alabama led by five in the first half. That was their biggest deficit the entire tournament, five points. Um, and so it, it's just remarkable the run that they've been on. Now I do think this year's team obviously is is more deserving of a spot in all time history than last year's team. This team lost one time the entire season when fully healthy, and that was to Creighton. Um, they just they just just destroyed teams all season, um, and so I, you know before this season, I think the best champion I can remember was 2018 Villanova, um, and they also went on just an incredible offensive run uh, in the NCAA tournament. Now that team didn't win the Big East that season, the biggest regular season title, um, and so does that kind of remove them from all time equations? It might, but that team to me personnel wise, and I mentioned this the other night. It feels the most similar to this year's team. That team had Jalen Brunson and Mikael Bridges, you know, two really good NBA players. We could probably say Klingon and and Castle are probably those two, you know, most similar in terms of NBA prospect. The rest of their starting five was Eric Pascal, Amari Spellman, and Phil Booth. Um, you know, I think UConn's team can stack up to that. DiVincenzo was on that team as a bench player. But, you know, that team ran through people, and that team didn't have, you know, five, six lottery picks. The Kentucky team... That went, what was it, 35 and 1, 39 and 1, whatever it was in 2015. Um, that team was probably the most dominant, talent filled, talent laden team I've seen. They didn't win a title. And so I think the fact that UConn won the Big East regular season, Big East tournament, NCAA tournament, all of them in dominating fashion, to check all three of those boxes, I don't remember another team that did all three. And for that reason, I think that they have a pretty favorable case to be, you know, one of the best teams of the last. I don't know, twenty years, maybe more. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't disagree with you. I, uh, you know, the thing that struck me from being around him in Boston last weekend, and obviously watching him here, is that, you know, like the best teams, the sum is greater than the parts. Now they have very good parts, right? It's not like, yeah, you know, I don't want to glorify the coaches as doing this great job with, you know, this the ragtag group, but I, they don't have the same parts that we saw teams in other eras have. Jeff, right. if that makes sense, right? If you go Al Horford, Joe Kim, Noah, Corey Brewer, that's a better talent nucleus from pure talent, NBA perspective, et cetera, than this, than this UConn team. And that's not a slight. I think comparing errors gets difficult when, you, when, when we do this. We touched on this with Reese a little bit the other day. But I just think collectively they were a hammer. And collectively they were unflinching. And, and collectively they, they pushed through any dollars of adversity that they had and dominated at the highest level. And also, when you're comparing errors, too, I, I think it's fair because you could say, oh, you know, those Duke teams played better teams because they had more. Sure. But you, you're judged by how you play against the teams in your era. And right. they were clearly by points, point markers. And there's a bunch of other stats, too. Uh, there are 140 uh, points they won in this tournament by is the most by 15 mm-hmm. points. And the next was what UNC in 2017, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think so. Was, was, was that what? So, like. They, you know, they they were 15 points through the NCAA tournament better than than anyone else. And again, you can win one early round game by four. That's not like a definitive metric. And I'm sure Ken Palm could think could think of better ways to quantify the the, the metrics. But the point is not maybe that they are that, that they would go beat one of those teams in some mythical game. But when you when they are compared to the best teams in their era, they were a clear marker ahead, uh, which I think. Uh, which I think is uh, is important. Um, so to 
to, to steer on here, let, let's talk a little bit about Dan Hurley and his place in the game right now, which in 12 and a half months or whatever it is, just completely radically shifted from him being a very good coach with something to prove to mm-hmm. one of the three most proven coaches. Uh, have you ever seen a coach reputationally leap this far ahead in such a short period of time? No, and, and I think the the interesting thing is that he knew it. I mean, he knew that he had he wasn't winning on the biggest stage like he wanted to. And he knew th- things had to change. And a lot of coaches don't do that. They're not going to look in the mirror and say, I'm the problem or what I want to do is the problem. Um, you know, for for most of Hurley's career, he wanted to win, you know, sort of rock fight games and say, we're going to be a tougher team. We're going to be a better defensive team and we're going to win that way. And then I think he realized at some point you can't win. And, and he even I mean, he said this a few times now, but he also said it uh, on uh, on Sunday, just in general, on how you win NCAA tournaments games now. He said you can't win if you can't score. And I think he realized, hey, I got to change our offense. I got to change our, our system. I got to go get guys that can go get shots and make shots. Um, and he completely transformed uh, how he coaches and, and every, how he approaches offense. And I, like to me, that's just – it's a sign of a really good coach. I mean, we, obviously, we've had all these conversations about Calipari and how he needs to adapt to to kind of kind of take the next step in his development. And and Hurley knew he had to do it, and he went out and and, and he kind of went against the grain. And again, this is something that, that we've met – that we've touched on briefly – but again, this is a, an era of basketball where, you know, you only have guys for a few months. And so coaches don't want to bombard them with, you know, we're going to run a play every time. We're going to run a set every time. Here's our playbook. It's 100 something plays or 200 something plays. And we're going to run one of these every time down the court. You have to know everything we're doing. And a lot of coaches will say, well, I only have this guy for six months. I'm not going to make him memorize all this stuff. We're going to run ball screens and whatever. Like Hurley said, no, we're going to do this. And he trusted his players. And they, they have not seemed to have an issue running plays they don't seem to say oh we don't play without freedom or you know he bogs us down with all these plays and all this no i mean nba guys will say they run the best offense they've seen in college it's the most nba like offense they've seen in college and it's free flowing and uh, i think ray allen or or mike ogopor said it's it's like music out there um and uh, i think ray allen compared it's like a football playbook where you know offensive line is asked to guard uh, asked to block there's certain guys on the floor who's whose role on a certain place is just a screen and they go out and they do it and they love it. Um, and he, he credited that to, to Hurley to get guys to buy in. And, you know, it's, to me, it's, it's kind of remarkable just to kind of flip the, a switch that he did after a long time coaching. Um, it, it's not easy to change. And he transformed everything he did and is now, you know, like you said, he's, he's in pretty rarefied air when it comes to college basketball coaches. Uh, there was a tweet today about Dan Hurley that I would consider it rarefied air. It was uh, from Wayne Dray's, uh, uh Midwest-based writer uh, and uh, friend of the program. Wayne Dray's said, I don't think we'll see jo- uh, Danny Hurley pushing his dog in a baby carriage like we saw John Calabari on the side of the road of Kentucky play. And I think Dan Hurley would probably agree with that sentiment, uh, don't, don't you, Jeff? <laughs> I, I, I also don't think he would, uh, if a TV reporter came up to him while he was walking his dog, I don't feel like he would have reacted as as pleasantly, maybe as uh, as Cal did. Uh, I think I think Hurley might have a couple of choice words uh, for a reporter if he approached him while walking his dog. I think that's very uh, I think that's very fair. Uh, I bring that up to say that uh, Danny Hurley was asked tonight about the Kentucky job, and um, yeah, you know, me, I can't resist a good coaching carousel storyline, so. Um, he, of course, uh, deflected to his wife, Andrea, who's from Freehold, New Jersey, home of Bruce Springsteen. I mean, I'm getting all the hits in here. I was going to say, yeah. um, you're really jamming this <laughs> stuff in. And uh, he said, uh, you know, he basically said he didn't have interest. You should ask my wife what she would think of moving. And so I, I of course, couldn't resist follow-up questions so after I asked him. And he said, uh, oh, my God, Kentucky or anywhere that's going to take her further from New Jersey. I mean, we just went to Rhode Island, which I had to drag her to. And then to Connecticut, I got her closer. And now further, I can't afford a divorce right now, too. I just started making money. So uh, that would seem to eliminate him from the Kentucky job. But he did have actually some, some pretty good insight into what's next for UConn. And as this has become the uh, official Boneyard podcast, game day podcast for the past uh, for the past three weeks, uh, he said, now you're thinking, this is Hurley, quote, now you're thinking in your brain as I'm looking at the locker room, 
about the chance to do it three times, like a dynasty in modern times. I mean, that's what I'm thinking about. Um, to, 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 to leave this on a pushing forward note, Jeff, what would UConn have to do in the upcoming days and weeks, and I guess months, to position its program to win a third title? I mean, top of that list would be keeping Dan Hurley, which I don't have any doubt that they'll be able to do. Um, I, I never really thought he would entertain uh, leaving for Kentucky. He seems to fit uh, UConn, the Northeast. He that his personality is much better suited for for there than the, than Kentucky. Um, Not think, a y'all guy, is that what you're? No, I mean the, the, the you know threatening, uh, you know talking and yelling at other teams' fans and stuff like that, and you know that he has endeared himself to the UConn fan base. I'm not entirely sure the Kentucky fan base would would uh would welcome that from day one, but no, I, he's in a perfect spot right now. You know, I he, they probably have to put him in the top five highest paid public school coaches at least. We don't know yeah. how much everyone makes, but you know if they put him after self. Cal and whoever the new Kentucky coach is, which would be, I think Nate Oates is making six and change right now. You put him ahead of Oates, and I think that's probably enough to keep him. I mean, I think keeping him where he is, is probably enough to keep him, but an incentive to keep him, um, that's number one. And secondly, I mean, they're going to have to rebuild this roster. Um, I think we can assume that Castle could leave or will leave, and Klingon will leave, and Newton's a senior, and Spencer's a senior. Diara has a COVID year. Caravan is he's rising in mock drafts. He's like a bona fide second round pick right now. So, you know, this it's going to be a completely different roster next season. They're going to have to go into the portal. And, and Hurley said, you know, strategically add players from the portal. Um, you don't think don't, Caravan's going to leave? He could. I mean, I, I think he could come back. I mean, I, my prediction would be that he comes back. But, you know, he is he is in mock drafts. And, you know, so he could go through the process and work out for teams. But I would imagine he comes back and, and is probably the, you know, maybe the f- focal point of the offense next season. But they have a couple of freshmen coming in. They're going to go into the portal. And they really like some of their young kids, you know, Solo Ball and, and Jaden Ross, some guys that that didn't really have huge roles. Jalen Stewart, uh, their freshman class from this season, taking the next step. So now you kind of you add a couple of veterans from the portal, especially in the front court. And, you know, Samson Johnson should probably take, a, you know, will take the next step down low. So. They're going to have to, you know, it takes kind of a leap of faith to say that UConn's going to compete for another, another title. But at this point, you know, there's not a lot of coaches you'd have more blind faith in than Dan Hurley. That is very fair. Well, the uh, confetti is on the ground on the court, Jeff. The uh, cleaning crews are bustling around us doing their uh, doing their job here. Any final parting thoughts on this uh, historic UConn back-to-back run before we uh, depart the desert? Um, Not really. I, I think that this might have been the only way that uh, the title game could even potentially overshadow Calipari leaving Kentucky. And it didn't really, because we spent a good few minutes on Hurley and Kentucky. So um, the, uh, the, the college basketball news cycle won't end tonight. Um, unfortunately, maybe, uh, but you no, know, yeah, it's a historic season, historic two year run. And again, in in an age of portal and NIL and all this, like, I don't know how often we're going to see back to back, champions at all in the next few decades yeah i think uh i think the degree of difficulty yep. repeating in this era is is extremely high and uh hats off to the yukon huskies your national champions your national back-to-back champions and uh the official sponsor of this podcast we will uh we will take a hard turn uh next week probably back to some head hardcore nfl draft talk and uh yeah, we'll probably talk a little bit about who's Kentucky's next coaches too. But Jeff, we appreciate you joining us tonight. We appreciate you joining us the past few weeks uh, as we have uh, moonlighted in uh, in college basketball. And uh, safe travels back to your big soccer match to coach tomorrow back on Long Island. Is that right? Yeah, my 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 four year old daughter. I, I gotta. It's the spring season has started. I need to I need to get back and draw some tactics. Get that phone off. Get focused. We we need we need we need a lot of good set plays off quarter camps. Okay, Jeff. <laughs> I'm going to ask Danny to see if he's got anything written up for me. Very good. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the NSA tournament. Have a good night.